No, this is absolute. I almost said a set. I almost swore then. This is a discovery of absolutely extraordinary proportions. And just for the record, I still don't believe it. What do we have here? What do we have here? We have a jellyfish. I will show you the jellyfish. I don't know where the head and tail are, and that's really important. I don't have a scooby-doo. Naughty snakes. And so one of these two is the end of the snake, then. It must come here to die. No, we can't have any more friendly cells in this box. This is the end of the snake. Suddenly, we've made huge progress. You naughty snakes. The dastardly Mark released a video the other night called How I Cheat at Sudoku. And see what would happen with the five of them. In which he demonstrated how to solve this puzzle using bifurcation. Because I have no particular reason to select that five. AKA guessing. Yeah, and that breaks straight away. Well, this almost straight away. You may think, ah, oh, now we're about to get a digit. No, 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 we're nowhere near getting a digit yet. Nowhere near. And suddenly, I've done all the fives. Now, if you know anything about me, you'll know I absolutely detest bifurcation. We're going to have to select something else to try. <laughs> and this puzzle channel is not called Guess the Answer. I mean, that's literally the only way I, I know of going about this. AKA guessing. Going to have to try something else. A double bifurcation, which I do not recommend. Wow, it's amazing how far you can get. The dastardly mark. Hopeless. It's an incredible setup, this, by the way. To have five simultaneous swordfishes. Well, it's incredible. It's quite evil, to be honest. Hello, hello. Oh, uh, <laughs> somehow Discord decided, oh, somehow Discord keeps turning Philip off, but uh, we should be good now. Stay, Discord. Oh, my word, what the heck? <laughs> Stop doing that. Okay, well, we'll see. Oh, technical difficulties already, but hello, everyone, and welcome <laughs> to the newest edition of Setter Spotlight. And welcome, Philip. How are you doing today? Doing okay. Hello Hopefully to- I'll be able to breathe okay. My sinuses have been terrible today. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I, I hate <laughs> sinus issues. They are the death of me. Discord, or sorry, yeah, Discord is being a little bit odd today, but uh, it's okay. We can power through its oddities. Um, <laughs> of course, it starts being odd as soon as we start the stream and not before, where we could easily deal with the issues. <laughs> it's a glitch in the matrix that has nothing to do with me not being a real person, being artificial intelligence, <laughs> nothing like that. Don't right. Don't worry, right. I'm a real person. <laughs> All right, so we usually start off the interview with some less Sudoku related questions and more uh, related questions to figure out whether the, the setter is a robot or not. Um, <laughs> and these are sponsored by our patrons, whose wonderful names are all around us right now. Uh, if you want your name up here, then uh, join the Patreon link in the description. All right. Uh, where whereabouts do you live, Philip? I am in Texas. I'm in the Dallas area, north of Dallas. Nice, nice. I won't get more specific than that. I know there are a lot of stalkers. Uh, I'm very worried about that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I get uh, gas is definitely a <laughs> lot more audience than in normal settings. So there's more a more lack of familiarity with Dallas suburbs. Right. So, probably wouldn't mean anything to anybody. <laughs> sure. Uh, so what do you do for work? Uh, I'm a programmer and a project manager for a voiceover IP company. So cool. I mostly handle our cordless phone product. Do some application programming for that and some organizational stuff and things like that kind of backed into the job that is not what I went to school for at all, but that's what I do. Uh, what would you do if you weren't doing that? Like, what's your, what's your dream job? 
Uh, right now, my dream job is making puzzles all the time, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's, um, that's a pretty common yeah. answer in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Growing up, I always thought I would be in academics, um, teaching math, but and I got burnt out on that a little bit, and yeah. Can't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Similar situation I'm in right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, my doctorate yeah. is in math. Um, I did math and chemistry as an undergrad. Um, but yeah, the the graduate degree took a long time and probably took years off of my life and things like that. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> It does do that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, how do you balance puzzling with other things in your life? Um, not very well, probably. <laughs> I spend too much time on puzzles. Um, I just I try and find time when I can. Um, I have two kids, yeah. so obviously they take take up a lot of my free time when they're awake. Um, so. Uh, it wasn't last night, but two nights ago I had, I was trying to fall asleep. It was around midnight and I randomly had this idea for not even a puzzle, just a theory and programming thing. So mm -hmm. I had to get out of bed and get it out of my brain uh, <laughs> before I could fall asleep. So there, there are lots of nights like that. Um, yeah, sometimes after the kids are in bed, I'll work on puzzle stuff for an hour, just depending on what my wife and I are doing. Um, sometimes in the morning before I start work, sometimes during lunch, just whenever I can fit it in. Right. Makes sense. Uh, <laughs> this is a weird, weird question time. Uh, if you were to write a book about your life, but could only use five words, what would they be? Write a book, but only use five words. Yeah. Oh, maybe you can repeat the words over and over again. <laughs> you could only use five words, but. <laughs> uh, it, it would be something dumb, I'm sure. Or it'd be <laughs> probably something like something. He was dumb, a very I'm good. Sure. <laughs> and then I ran out of words. So it's just he was a very good. <laughs> and that's it. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple questions from viewers that don't really relate too much to puzzles, so I'll ask them here. First one is from Logan Paul. He asks, uh, Nilip Fuman? Question mark. Yeah, so that's my evil doppelganger from the Gas series. Um, we've had a few of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> I came up with Sham Kappelman lines, um, and I don't I don't know who came up with Nilla Fuman. Probably <laughs> Sam or Clover. I don't think it was me, but yeah, it's my evil doppelganger that definitely doesn't exist. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, if if you get up during the interview and have to go uh, get a drink or something, I, I'm sure. No, it will come to this. <laughs> yeah, I, I should just warn you, my mustache grows very rapidly, so right. if I come back and... <laughs> <laughs> right. Good to keep in mind. <laughs> and, uh, oh, it's Stark asked, um, are you really a new man, or are you kind of old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember seeing this one. I feel old most of the time, um, especially now that I have kids. They make me feel old all the time. Um, I, I, I've always felt, I've always felt like I was thirty mentally. Like when I was a teenager, I felt like I was thirty mentally, and now I feel like I'm thirty mentally, and I don't think that's ever going to change. Like I don't think I'm going <laughs> to suddenly become like an old man like grumpy and serious all the time and things like that 
I, I'm probably always going to be goofy, but yeah. Physically, I feel like an old man. Definitely. That's the effect of the doctorate again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that has something to do with it, yeah. Um, and I am 40, so uh, that, that feels old. People tell me that's not old, but I don't believe them. <laughs> not as old as, as you could be, I guess, is what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, another another weird question. I guess the new human and the weird old one are, are worried too, but uh, these are from ChatGPT, by the way. I, I asked ChatGPT to give me some intro questions oh, every no. time, and uh, some of them are really strange, and I'm not sure where it comes up with these. Uh, well, I guess it's just word generation, but uh, this one was particularly odd. If you were given a rope that takes one hour to burn completely and two matches, how would you use them to measure exactly 45 minutes? <laughs> okay, I yeah, I know this one. So uh, I can get into a little background um, with this question um, of how I got into puzzles. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was interested in puzzles as a kid. Um, but when I was a teenager, I, and the internet was very young and nothing like it is now, um, I stumbled on a puzzle website that had a lot of this type of question, like kind of logical math stuff, but also some lateral thinking and things like that, um, and ended up participating on their forums. I actually became an admin of the site. Um, and this was this was 22 years ago I was an admin of the site. Um, that makes me feel old um, anytime something comes up like that. Anyway, <laughs> the answer is you uh, light one end of the rope, wait till it burns halfway, and then you light the other end of the rope and you get 45 minutes. Assuming that the rope burns evenly. Interesting. <laughs> Still, <laughs> I like Luke Girl's answer. Sell, sell the rope and the matches and buy a stuff watch. <laughs> Thank you. I think underestimating how much a good stopwatch cost. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you could get much for the rope and matches. You could uh, use the the fact that you know it burns in an hour is like sort of a selling point, but uh, yeah, you probably wouldn't get very much. That's true. It's a very special rope if you know it burns in exactly one hour. Yeah. You could even measure it. You could even use it to measure 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you could sell the matches as these make the rope burn in exactly one hour. True. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> Now we're asking how how could you sell my just uh, and the rope for, <laughs> for the price of a stopwatch? Um, <laughs> if ChatGPT were really advanced, it would have come up with that. Yeah, exactly. I should ask it to answer the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you have uh, a favorite type of food? Um, I I like a lot of uh, Tex-Mex type food tacos, uh, things like that. Um, just mostly general American type stuff. I like right. pizza. I like burgers. Um, but I'll, I'll eat pretty much anything. Um, when I was living in England, I ate curry all the time because uh, that is very convenient to get over there. And not so much here. There's not, there's not a lot of great Indian food. There are a few places I've been to around here, but uh, yeah, uh, I'll eat almost anything. There are a couple of exceptions to that. I do not like pickles, and I do not like olives. But interesting, yeah. Uh, do you have any hobbies or interests outside of puzzling? Um, I play some video games. Um, I've always been a Nintendo guy. We had a NES when I was growing up and uh, 
we had an Atari before that. I I played some very weird games on the Atari and mentioned them occasionally on Discord. Um, I distinctly remember one called Captain Beeble, which was just the greatest name for a video game. Um, <laughs> and it had just the most annoying sounds in it. It's it's horrible. Um, and uh, I remember a couple of games, uh, Preppy and Preppy 2. Preppy was a knockoff of Frogger, and Preppy 2 was a knockoff of Pac-Man. <laughs> and um, I, I played them quite a bit, but my mom was really into Preppy 2, and it only had five levels, and the one time she got to the fifth level and was playing really well, my dad thought it would be funny to come up behind her and do this, <laughs> mess her up, and she, I don't think she's ever forgiven him for that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I always had the Nintendo consoles uh, growing up. Uh, I was more into Mario when I was younger, but the Zelda series is my favorite now. Cool. Um, board games, I play a lot of board games, have way too many board games in the house that don't get played enough. Um, uh, Dominion is my favorite game. I don't know how many people are into hobby board games and have played Dominion. I, um, I, but... I was literally playing a game on the Dominion app just before we started this interview, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've been into Dominion since it came out. I remember playing the base game in person for the first time um, at a meetup. It's actually an internet meetup uh, for my website. But I ended up playing Dominion a lot online at one point. I was, I, I think I peaked at like 15th ranked player um, and have participated in most of the annual tournaments online. But I, I'm out of practice now and I haven't kept up with the latest expansions. So not as good as I used to be. Um, and what I'm known for more online is Mafia, uh, the party game, which is mm -hmm. also called Werewolf. Um, that, that puzzle website that I was talking about, I randomly decided, hey, it would be fun to try Mafia with this group of very smart, very logical people and see what happens. And it basically just took over the forum so i split it off into its own website and that has been running for it's almost an adult it's been running for 21 years as of tuesday this coming tuesday wow uh, yeah i'm not as active on there anymore because i got sucked into sudoku that takes <laughs> up all my time but <laughs> i do still pay for the website cool <laughs> yeah um so yeah i can i can talk about mafia theory at length um but this is not the uh mafia spotlight of philip newman so i won't yeah. <laughs> I, I would love to hear you talk about mafia theory in length i i also enjoy mafia quite a bit so <laughs> i've i've made a couple of mafia related puzzles uh, hmm. i think i posted one of them on discord and Sam thought about it for a while. Um, and I don't think ever figured out the answer. But yeah, I can post those sometime. They're pretty interesting. It's impressive to stump Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that he thought about it for that long. I think oh, he would have okay. figured it out if he had spent more time on it. Right. Uh, all right, let's move into the puzzle related questions so i usually start off by just asking what was the first puzzle that you you ever said yeah so uh, i knew this was going to be a question and so i've been thinking about it um the answer is i have no idea um <laughs> i i was in into puzzles at a very young age i don't remember making a puzzle um before i joined that puzzle forum and I was going to get on there and look and see what the earliest one from me that I could find is unfortunately about four or five months ago 
they had a massive database problem and the forum is inaccessible. So, um, mm. I, yeah, I have no idea what it was on there. Um, I, there, there were some puzzle types that I made. I, I posted some math type puzzles. Uh, one, I remember it was a series of numbers and find the next number in the sequence. And the, I, I should have put together the numbers so I could just give it as a puzzle. But the answer was it was the numbers um, that you can have a rectangular prism that has the same surface area and volume. The number was the surface area and volume. And there's exactly nine of them if you use integer links. Interesting. Um, <laughs> so I remember that one. Um, I remember one that was posed to me by a professor as an undergrad, um, but I didn't make that one. Um, this type of puzzle, Sudoku and pencil puzzles, I started messing around with them. I, I came across the Cracking the Cryptic channel sometime in 2019. Uh, the first puzzle that I actually remember watching was a Sam puzzle. It was the one with all the jellyfish. So if you've ever wondered why I put so many swordfish in my puzzles, you can blame the, that, um, seeing that and thinking that was a cool pattern. And hey, there's something interesting in Sudoku other than just look for where this digit can go in the row. Because uh, that's kind of what I thought of Sudoku before then was, okay, it's just kind of this tedious thing where you're looking for where one can go in row two and, you know, just the bad puzzles that you get in, like, airplane magazines. <laughs> that was right. that was my experience with them. Um, I was more familiar with good pencil puzzles before that. Uh, one of the members of that puzzle forum uh, was Grant Fikes, who has done a ton of good pencil puzzles. Um, I knew him when he was a kid. He was probably 12 or 13 um, posting on there. But he went on to have a puzzle blog and post a lot of great puzzles. Um, so I was familiar with those and had solved some of those, but I never tried to make one. Um, so after seeing the Cracking the Cryptic video on the jellyfish. And in that video, Simon brings up Andrew Stewart's solver and says, hey, this has this obscenely high score of like 1,500 and something. But a human can solve it. So that's cool. He still does that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I saw that the solver exists, so I went and checked it out and saw you could put in your own digits and it would tell you how many solutions it had if it was a low number and it would tell you how to solve it. And so I just started experimenting it with it. Um, my first Sudoku was probably just some sort of pattern. Um, I don't know if it was my first or not, but I have a old uh, Google Sheets with puzzles in it because that's where I stored them before I knew about F puzzles. And it it just has one to nine down the diagonal, which I I've, I've done that so <laughs> many times now. Yeah. Um and it had digits and orders on adjacent diagonals and a few more givens. And it was a very easy puzzle. Um I was interested in digits of pi early on because I'm a mathematician, of course I was. Um, so I have a very early by hand um, symmetrical pi puzzle that's also very easy and very pretty. Um, the first puzzle that I actually published was Tattooing Sunset, which was also my first feature. Um, I came across a Sudoku forum looking into harder techniques, how to solve things, and... Uh, by then, I had discovered sort of the pattern that leads to all these swordfish and puzzles and had 
found this really interesting one. So I posted it there to see what they thought of it. And after the reception that it got there, I sent it to Crack and the Cryptic, because why not? And I wasn't expecting um, it to get a feature, <laughs> never mind two solves and a couple of other mentions. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that was a really exciting day um, when when I saw that for the first time. And of course I saw it and it was, yeah, we're going to show this puzzle. I couldn't solve it. So here it is. <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah. And I joined the Discord right after that, like four days later. I, I hadn't realized that Tatooine subset was the first puzzle that you published or that it was, or before like doing a little bit of research that it was the first feature that you had. Yep. But it yep. must have been, <laughs> I guess it's a pretty different experience having a feature where you get two features and one of them is not really a soft path at all. <laughs> and the other one is uh, like a real feature. Uh, w were you disappointed at all with the first one? <laughs> or... No, no. I, I loved that Mark showed how to bifurcate a puzzle. I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, honestly, the, on the forum, the first solution for Tatooine Sunset used multi-sector lock sets, which I had no idea what they were at the time. Mm -hmm. I knew it solved with a bunch of swordfish and an X-Wing. Had no idea what this complicated looking disaster of a technique was. So that got me into that type of deduction and eventually playing around with the stuff that led to set. So, yeah. Cool. I did not come up with set. I came up with the name for set. Um, right. But I was involved in some of those early discussions. Do you want to talk about that a bit? I mean... Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so there's there's a great video of Trevor Tao solving Tatooine Sunset. And he talks about a nine-dimensional uh, wonky fish is what he called it, <laughs> which is just the greatest name for something. Um, but it's not exactly multi-sector lock sets, and it's not exactly set, but it's related. He mm. kind of divided the grid up into almost, almost like a disjoint group sort of thing, but right. um, based on where the givens are placed. And made deductions based on what had to go in these groups of digits, um, which was very akin to set. And so uh, Tom Collier, who I don't know how many people are familiar with Tom, um, he was heavily involved in speed solving competitions, I think organized some, wrote some, um, had a few early features on Cracking the Cryptic, uh, but he has a blog where he discusses puzzle related things and had some thoughts on Trevor's video and multi-sector lock sets, uh, which Sam was involved in. Um, and we kind of brought in ideas like Fist of Mephel Ring, which people knew about at that point, but hadn't really been used in puzzles. Um, Fred Stadler had come up with a generalization of it, uh, which seems obvious now, but at the time is like, okay, the Fissimafel thing is there. <laughs> the ring and the corner boxes have the same digits, but what else can we do with that? Right. And of course, I mean, for a while after that, we got people in theory and programming saying, Okay, I know the fifth Smithel ring, but did you know you can shift the columns over and shift the rows up and you get a different pattern? Uh, to the point where we almost needed an FAQ for the fifth Smithel ring. But <laughs> yeah, so it was just some of us talking about how all these things were related. And Sam came up with the idea of adding and subtracting sets of one to nine. Right. Um, literally using like plus one and minus one. I think there were spreadsheets involved at some point. <laughs> um, but 
the the more common formulation uses colors, of course, and just mm -hmm. canceling out overlaps. And then I started brainstorming um, names for the thing, and I like recursive acronyms. And so that's how we landed <laughs> on set, and fortunately not some other things that I came up with. Um, and I just started playing with it, did some uh, puzzles with more complicated things. Uh, I called it mutant set, even though that's not really a great name for it, but set using boxes um, for different types of deductions that aren't direct, but it's kind of taken off from there. And of course it applies to some variants really easily and lots of people have done cool things with it. What do you think about <laughs> the general <laughs> conception of set now like people are kind of kind of done with it uh don't really like puzzles with it that much anymore and it seems kind of tedious and repetitive yeah that doesn't surprise me um once you're familiar with enough with it they become pretty easy to see and and to make the puzzle very easy to solve like you just get a bunch of pencil marks and then you finish it off. Um, there are still lots of clever things to do with it, though. So I, I certainly don't mind seeing set in a puzzle, but that shouldn't surprise anybody. Uh, but yeah, and in classics, I think there's still room for some variation on it. And also in viewing more complicated techniques as set or something like set. Um, I wrote a document about viewing exosets as set. Right. Um, and I mean, they're, they're rare exotic techniques that a lot of people aren't that familiar with and don't appear in a lot of puzzles that get featured on Cracking the Cryptic. <laughs> I think there's been maybe two exoset puzzles. Maybe three. I don't know. Yeah. Um, something like that. Yeah. But... So, for people who aren't like super into classics and don't really understand what you mean when you say like set in classics, because a lot of people are more familiar with set in terms of of variant Sudoku. Like, what do you mean right. by that? Yeah. So the basic form of set is just I'm gonna pick some rows. And I'm going to call those plus one, or I'm going to call those orange or whatever. Mm. And I'm going to pick some columns and call those minus one or blue. And if I have the same number of rows and columns, then those two colors have the same set of digits because they're complete sets of one to nine. And so then if I get rid of the overlap cells, I get rid of all the cells that are orange and blue then I'm left with some cells that look completely unrelated, but have to have the same digits. Um, right. And you can do more with that. You can have imbalance sets where you have five rows and four columns, say. Um, the checkerboard one is very common. Um, but it can be very useful in classics. And in fact, I believe... I haven't like exhaustively shown this, but I believe any, um, how do I say this <laughs> <laughs> without, without getting way into the weeds, um, any technique like basic fish or, uh, continuous nice loops. I'm already in the weeds of just saying <laughs> continuous nice loop. Um, a certain class of, of technique have some sort of set equivalent. Um, you can view them that way. You can view any swordfish as set. And the, the thing with Tatooine and Sunset, the reason why this came up, is you can resolve several of the swordfish at the same time using set. Right. And sort of bypass, rather than having to do seven swordfish and an X-wing, you have to do a couple of different sets. Hmm. And 
that results a puzzle. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I think it's been used a lot in variant Sudoku because you can do things that don't rely specifically on knowing the digits, but you can use sums. Right. Or you can use um, like clone cells, palindromes, things where you know these digits are the same. So you can cancel out more cells. Right. Is there any classic technique that you like definitely cannot do with set and it, it should be obvious from that? Yes. The construction of it? Um, yeah, there, there are techniques you can't do with set um, directly. Uh, as an example, um, Thor's hammer. Right. Which, again, complicated to explain. <laughs> yes, very <laughs> If you're complicated. not familiar with it. And I, there's, an, there's never been a CTC feature featuring that particular technique. Although I did have a contest puzzle with it. Um, Clover, you are welcome to do seven swordfish and X wing anytime you want. Um, <laughs> even if the puzzle is all singles. So you feel free. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's, a, there's something called uh, rank of a technique. There's rank zero, and rank zero is your basic fish, your continuous nice loops, your set, um, things like that. Set, I believe, is equivalent to all of those. Um, but then you have things that are rank one, things like Y wings. Y wings are not equivalent to set. You can kind of come up with a set and argue logically from that set and right. get the same deduction. But ultimately, what you're doing is just the Y wing logic mm -hmm. in another form. Um, they can't be equivalent because they don't have the same rank. Right. Um, and maybe, <laughs> maybe later, depending on what questions you ask, we'll <laughs> get into what the rank stuff is. But uh, yeah, that might be a little too much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> too much into the weeds. Yeah. The, the other thing I'll mention on this subject, again, without getting into too much detail, um, Mitchell Lee came up with this idea well i don't know that he came up with the idea um, but you can have something called fractional sudoku where instead of each cell containing a digit it contains fractions of digits such that the fractions add up to one so say you have a third of a two and two thirds of a nine that right. can go in your cell and you still have sudoku rules but your sudoku rules are each row, column, and box contains one of each digit. <laughs> so you have a third of a two in this cell and two thirds of a two in this other cell. Um, so it turns out there are some techniques that also apply to fractional Sudoku. Mm. Um, and so we, we took to calling them fractionally valid. Um, if you have a unique solution for a puzzle as a classic Sudoku, and all of the techniques that you use are fractionally valid, it also solves uniquely as a fractional Sudoku. But that's not the case for every fractional Sudoku. Right. Um, <laughs> most of them have infinite solutions. Um, so it turns out the rank zero techniques are the ones that are fractionally valid. Um, so set, fish, things like that. Interesting. Yeah. Allegedly, Mitchell is going to have a video about fractional Sudoku um, that I don't know when he's ever actually going to release it. <laughs> so <laughs> I've, I've seen some images from it, but. Was this promised like two years ago or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he, he wrote a script to calculate the fractional dimension of a puzzle. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> Which is kind of a, a metric for how complicated it is in terms of the techniques. Not necessarily how hard it is, hmm. but it's kind of a measure for difficulty. Uh, the ones with a really high value, they aren't necessarily the hardest puzzles, but 
they tend to have some advanced step at the start of them. Um, but yeah, he, he wrote a program to calculate this. I ran it on some very hard puzzles so we could see what they looked like. That's how I identified some of the hardest puzzles that are actually just solvable with set. Hmm. So, yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh, this question that I have here will probably be kind of hard to answer because there's, I think there's a lot of different ways that you go about setting different kinds of puzzles, but I, I guess describe in a few words what your setting process is. How do you go from a concept to a finished puzzle? <laughs> and a few words per type of puzzle that I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I said a lot of different ways. Um, so I'm a programmer. Uh, early on with things like Tatooine and Sunset, I got interested in very hard puzzles. So I got into how those are generated. Um, most of them are generated by something called neighborhood search. It turns out if you have a hard puzzle and you remove a couple of givens and add a couple of givens, you're more likely to end up with a hard puzzle than if you just started with some random puzzle and did that. So that's how a lot of the hardest puzzles are found. Uh, so I have a bunch of scripts that do things like that. Uh, I have something on the order of 33 million very hard puzzles on my computer <laughs> uh, that are all different, essentially different. They can't no be one, morphed into Almost each no other. one can, in the world can say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, about 30 million of that I haven't actually published anywhere. It's just... <laughs> um, yeah my local copy of the database. So that's one type of thing, uh, computer-generated stuff. A lot of puzzles, I will start with a pattern that I like and see what I can do with it. So the the tattooing puzzles, uh, there's some computer-generating involved in those, but initially I just started with a cool pattern uh, that wasn't even those sun shapes originally it was different diagonal form of it but i morphed it into the, the twin suns hmm. which i think helped get it recognized because it looks cool yeah. um <laughs> but i find when i when i do patterns like that a lot of times something interesting emerges from the pattern that makes for some interesting logic. So like the swordfish and tattooing sunset. Um, especially now that I'm doing gas, a lot of times I will just start with, hey, I want to do this constraint, maybe killer cages, and I want to do something very basic with it that people are going to be able to spot. So maybe um, I'm doing two cell killer cages and I start with a two cell three cage that Everybody's going to be able to fill in. That's one, two. And then do something from there. So maybe it's pointing at a four and that dis disambiguates the four cage and so on. Um, occasionally I will have a puzzle that I'm just looking specifically to do something with it, like minimal puzzles like White Room or. Uh, the snake puzzle with the friendly cells. I specifically went out and looked for what turns out to be the only possible way to draw a snake out of the maximum number of friendly cells. Um, and somebody else actually found it for me. And then I made a puzzle around it. So hmm. lots of different ways to do it. Um, I know a lot of people start from, I want to include this particular piece of cool logic and then what can I add to further logical path and that's a great way to do it. I don't set most of my puzzles that way. Maybe 20% of them. So interesting. Yeah. Uh <laughs> that was more than a few words. Yeah, <laughs> a couple words at least. <laughs> Uh, 
This is a really interesting question that I'd, I'd love to hear the answer to, so I'll ask it right away so I don't forget. Uh, the Sonic person had asked, do you think your Sudoku discoveries could be helpful in the real world? Which is just an interesting question to me. <laughs> yeah, so it's easy to brush this off as like, no, yeah. of course not. But um, I come from a pure math background. Like originally I thought I was going to be in some very like abstract theoretical hard to apply field of math. Um, it didn't end up going that way. My my thesis is actually in theoretical physics more than math. Um, it just does some math stuff with it. Uh, but the way I view it is we we never really know what math is going to be useful. Uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of really weird math things. Uh, the example <laughs> that comes to mind is that thing you'll see with one plus a half plus a third plus et cetera et cetera equals negative one twelve, which is obviously not true the way you usually add numbers. Um, but there's a particular way you can define that sort of series and end up with negative one twelfth as your answer. And for whatever reason, this sort of series pops up in like quantum physics or something like that. Just completely unexpected place. Maybe particle physics. I don't remember. Um, so you never know what's what's going to be useful to somebody. Um, a lot of the techniques and stuff we discuss in theory and programming, they don't seem like they're ever going to have any use outside of Sudoku or outside of this type of puzzle. But we end up discussing a lot of graph theory stuff and just connections between things that right. could be more broadly useful. So who knows? Yeah, I mean, whenever you're, like, for example, set, whenever you're describing something very complicated in a very simple way, I think that has the potential to be useful in some other thing. Yeah, at the very least, it has the potential to inspire other people looking at some completely different problem to try and simplify it and yeah, try exactly. and look at it in a different way. Oh, yeah, you're right. Positive integers. What's the sum of one plus a half plus a third? I know it's a harmonic sequence, but I don't know. It probably <laughs> has some cool negative answer. But yeah, Glum Hippo's <laughs> right. Negative one twelfth is one plus two plus three plus four, etc. Makes sense, right? <laughs> obvious. Yeah, obviously. If I don't butcher it. <laughs> uh Okay, I need to know what are your thoughts on T and L and other generalized <laughs> ideas, good or bad, worth knowing, question mark. This is a question that Jovial asked, and I've been dying to know what the heck T or L even means. As I'm yeah. sure most so, people have <laughs> Yeah, so when I when I brought up rating zero and said we might discuss this more, um, this is the question <laughs> I had okay. in mind. Um, when, when I saw this, I didn't even know what TNL was. I had never <laughs> seen it abbreviated that way. Um, I had to figure it out basically by searching on Discord or shy talking about it. Um, TNL stands for truths and links. Okay. Um, so I, I don't actually use this myself very much, but what it's equivalent to is when you're talking about basic fish um i'm going to try and explain this without having to bring up a grid but i may have to bring up a grid um if you think about a swordfish a swordfish you have a particular digit that is limited say in three rows and it can only appear in certain positions in three rows and it happens that the positions that it can appear in are limited to three columns and that's what gives you a swordfish. 
Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to have all of the positions in every row. Um, but if those positions are limited to three columns and you started with three rows, you have a swordfish. And the reason you have a swordfish in terms of truths and links is you need that digit in each of the three rows. Those are your truths. Okay. You can cover the cells that they can appear in with three columns. Those are your links. And when you can do that and you have the same number of truths and links, then the placement in the links has to be true. So you have to have that digit in one of the cells in the column that is part of those rows. So you can eliminate from the other cells in the column. Um, so if you have the same number of truths and links, that's rank zero. That's that's what the zero is referring to. It's truths minus links. I think that's right. Or links minus truths. Links minus truths, probably. I don't know. I I can't visualize. Well, I can't visualize at all, but I can't <laughs> I can't figure <laughs> out which direction it should go on on the spot. But anyway, um, if you have rank one, that means basically you have a degree of freedom with it. So something like a fin fish, where you have this one cell off somewhere that doesn't fit nicely, but you can still make eliminations because some cell might see the fin and be in one of the columns, things right. like that. So still useful, but more limited. Rank zero, a regular swordfish eliminates a whole lot of candidates in three different columns. A fin swordfish eliminates candidates that are in one of those columns, but also see this other cell. So you don't get as much from it. You can have rank two as well, um, but it's really uncommon at that point that you have an elimination. Right. Um, as for how useful it is, obviously I think it's useful as long as you have terminology that you can understand. I don't usually think of it as truths and links. I think of it as base sets and cover sets. Uh, maybe that's from messing with set a lot where you're adding rows and subtracting columns. That seems more natural to me than thinking about the candidates themselves, but it's definitely useful. Um, a lot of those, how do I wanna say this? A lot of those rank zero <laughs> techniques have equivalence with set, have equivalence with multi-sector lock sets and doubly linked almost lock sets and basic fish and Frankenfish and mutant fish and so on. That as long as you can see the deduction somehow, um, that can be very useful in solving a puzzle. Now, do you want to design a puzzle around that? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, telegraphing it can be pretty hard unless the solver comes into it expecting something like that. I would say definitely worth knowing with the caveat that the specific terminology that you use doesn't matter so much unless you're looking at a shy diagram and want to understand what is going on. <laughs> right. Shy does truth and link diagrams all the time. Interesting. Uh, I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned telegraphing because some people recently i don't remember when but i mentioned that telegraphing is a lot more natural with with variant sudoku because you can like put things into the grid that indicate that where you're supposed to look but that's not really as much i feel at least the case with classic sudoku so how do you telegraph classic sudoku you know well way yeah so this isn't something I really thought about much when I was originally setting classics. It's something I thought about more when we started doing the Sudoku pack, mm -hmm. um, where we were trying to, if not T 
teach techniques at least make make them accessible in the sense that if you look at it long enough you can find it <laughs> um now did we succeed on all of those puzzles probably not um timberlake did a video recently on the dragonfly puzzle from the first pack which has a broken wing in it a single value autogon and it tripped so many people up because it is it's so hard to see and it's not at all obvious that you should be looking at that digit um but some of the other ones like you can do things like the way you morph the puzzle so any classic sudoku you can swap columns as long as they're in the same stack you can swap rows as long as they're in, as they're in the same band you can swap bands you can swap stacks you can rotate you can reflect and you can permute the digits so if you want people to look at a particular triple say in a in a thor's hammer puzzle where triplets are very very important um you make those one two three or you make those seven eight nine and that's gonna pop a little better mm -hmm. um and you can also rearrange things so say the deduction is specific to a cell or specific to a box put that in the top left because that's where everybody looks first um clover is really good at this for gas um and that's more variant sudoku than classics but the same thing applies you want to draw the solver's attention somehow so you're a little more limited in how you do that with a classic but there are ways to do it right uh we're almost an hour in so i will ask you why don't you plug your patreon why should the people who are watching the stream right now go and join it because you like me don't you <laughs> don't you like me <laughs> um so it's a good way to support setters um there are several setters that have patreons um mine was clearly inspired by clovers it has a very similar format in terms of what you get um but yeah it's it's a good way to support setters uh we none I, i'm not gonna say none almost none of us are making a living off of this right. we all have other jobs we all have lives outside of puzzles it's it's a way to say hey i appreciate what you're doing keep doing it mm -hmm. um, keep spending time on it um, as far as the puzzles in my pack i try and do a a uh, good range of difficulties. They are not all impossibly hard puzzles. Um, I try to give a expectation for how difficult they are. Um, it's not going to correspond. So I, I do one to five stars. It's not going to correspond with one to five on the Discord archive or on LMD. Um, but I I specify what I mean by each of those, and. Typically, half of the puzzles are going to be two star, maybe one star. And at most, one of the puzzles is four or five star. In fact, they've all been four star so far. I My my five star level, I don't remember exactly how I worded it, but it's something like, Philip found something that's crazy unique and had trouble solving it. <laughs> and <laughs> most of those I, I put in theory and programming or right. something like that. They're, they're not really intended to be solved um, by most people. But yeah, it's it's a good variety. I have different variants for every puzzle each month. Um, I'm trying not to just have a German Whispers puzzle every month, as much as I like <laughs> making German Whispers puzzles. Um, they hopefully have a sense of humor. Um, I like putting patterns in my puzzles. I like giving my puzzles silly names. Um, and if you just want the puzzles, that's what the first tier is for. The second tier, you get a bonus puzzle and you also get solve videos. Uh, I haven't, I don't really have anything on my YouTube channel other than the intro for Patreon, mm -hmm. but I have been planning for a while to do some sort of puzzle content. 
and the salt videos are kind of easing me into doing that getting comfortable <laughs> with it um and they are long um the the last couple have been over two hours for eight puzzles um so 15 minutes a puzzle that's that's not terribly long for an individual puzzle but put it all together and yeah it's a lot of content so um people have found that helpful uh hopefully hopefully it's a good pace as well so yeah all of those reasons um i'm gonna be totally honest i'm not like suffering for cash right now um my my family is doing okay um but having that support definitely helps encourage me to spend more time on it right. um, and i like doing it so yeah yeah support me support other people if you can does it take a lot of your time to do this patreon stuff um so it's a good question um it probably takes me longer to do the solve videos than it does to make the puzzles honestly um I make puzzles pretty fast. Uh, gas puzzle. I might I might make a dozen puzzles and only two or three of them are actually gas level, but I might do that in a couple of hours, um, hmm. like ten minutes a puzzle, something like that. Um, it's easier for gas because I have some clear concept of what I'm trying to communicate and i'm not trying to make it the hardest thing in the world with this incredibly elegant break-in that you're gonna have to stare at for 30 minutes um, right. <laughs> but i mean uh, that's true of most of my puzzles there there are a handful of puzzles that i've spent hours on and for the most part i'll just get an idea and i'll put it down and i'll tinker with it and i'll find something unique fairly quickly and right. then the question is am i happy with this or do i want to tweak it mm -hmm. so yeah i'm making puzzles i i have a big file of potential patreon puzzles that probably currently has i don't know 70 puzzles in it that haven't already been used um most of them will probably never see the light of day on patreon in fact about a dozen of them the description is not just the variant it is disgusting arrow or disgusting crop key <laughs> or whatever um those are the puzzles that i'm not even sure i can solve <laughs> <laughs> i think they're cool so they're listed but i have i have a lot of puzzles backlogged and more of the time is spent going through them and resolving them and making sure they're fair and interesting and sending them to testers putting the packed together in the format that I use and then recording the solve videos, which takes multiple hours. Right. Uh, so let's talk about a different one of your projects. Uh, Ron Planer asks, will you keep working on the Sudoku database? Yeah. So I have a, a website, Sudoku theory.com. Uh, the Patreon is named after the website. So it's patreon.com slash Sudoku theory. Um, the original intention for the website was nerd snipes. So in theory and programming, people are asking questions and I get interested in those questions and I spend way too much time thinking about them. <laughs> and for whatever reason, I have a, I have a gift of finding answers to a lot of those questions. Um, so if you click on, click on the Snipes um, link, I thought it would be funny to make all of the titles start with S, because Sudoku. Um, <laughs> but this is a list of all of these results that we've gotten um, for fewest of constraint in a puzzle that's unique, or most of a constraint, or things like that. Um, and there's a lot of results and you will see my initials on a lot of them and 
a few other people. Um, we're we're always bouncing ideas off of each other in Ethereum programming. Um, Ryakusha a lot of the time has some sort of program to look for minimums. Obviously, we use Rank Solver a lot. Um, yeah, and post an interesting question, and I am likely to spend some time thinking about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I want to expand this. Um, there's obviously some stuff on here that isn't included yet, just because I haven't gotten around to updating it. It is a wiki, so if you are aware of one of those things, feel free to add it. Uh, but I'm also planning to add other pages. Um, I have a list of classic techniques that I want to write descriptions of, add some diagrams, things like that. Um, Andrew Stewart's wiki has a lot of stuff, but it doesn't have most of the newer exotic stuff. Yes, Clipper, you can add stuff to the page. It is an open wiki. Hopefully we won't get a lot of spam that I'll have to clean up. Anyway, um, I also want to add a page for sites, so our tools as well. So Rank Solver, how to integrate that into F puzzles, uh, Sudoku Pad, all of the various setters and creators that have YouTube channels and Patreons and stuff like that, and just kind of make it a centralized place for looking for interesting Sudoku stuff. Cool. But I'm constantly procrastinating because I have too much going on in my life. <laughs> As we've we've covered. <laughs> uh Rockrat Zero asks a very important question. Uh so it's become clear to me that shedding tears at some point in the process is important for humans to produce quality classic Sudoku. Since you're a robot, do you cry? Um, yes, occasionally. Um, <laughs> I've actually been, I've actually been having a serious problem with my eyes being very, very dry because of my allergies. And so like, there, there's no chance that I would cry today. Doesn't matter how sad I got. Um, my, my eyes are not producing any tears at all. I feel like sandpaper right now, but. Yeah, I, I have feelings. <laughs> Be nice to me. <laughs> Tear reveal. <laughs> uh, actually, we should we should ask we should have asked this question earlier. Uh, when you went through the nerd snipes, of all the nerd snipes, what is your what is the most surprising one? As floating walls question. I mean, it's got to be white room, just for how minimal it is. Um, aside from that, though, I would probably say the the Kropke one, just because I didn't think it would go that low when I was initially messing with it. And for a while, I didn't see how to lower it. Like I, I was, I feel like I was stuck at 15 dots for a while before I lowered it. Um, I would say the arrow puzzle, but the, the arrow puzzle, I kind of ripped off from a puzzle with six arrows and just slightly modified it to make it five. <laughs> <laughs> so it can't be that surprising if I had already seen the six. Um, right. but yeah. Those are probably the top three. Uh, since you mentioned White Room, I'll ask Talk Ask question now. An aspect of your puzzling style tends towards pushing the limits of clues slash information in puzzles, yeah, e.g. White Room. What it, is it that appeals to you about this? Yeah, so I don't know that there is a specific obsession with finding <laughs> the fewest clues or the most clues or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's more to do with, I am very curious about things and right. I like to know the answer to things. 
and people ask these interesting questions. <laughs> so when I started on White Room, it was just, I believe, uh, Grockles asked what the minimum cell coverage was in theory and programming. And I ran with it from there um, over the course of about nine days. Um, it was a whole process, which I'm happy to show. Um, I can do that now or later. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had a whole progression going from 32 cells down to 18. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll look at that in just a second. Uh, first, we'll, we'll visit this question, which is very relevant to what we will look at in a second, which is Glipperol's question of, if not right now, well, sort of right now, we will do that. Uh, at some point, would you consider streaming slash recording a full nerd snipe session with all the tools, live commentary on your thought process? Possibly. Um, definitely not right now. <laughs> That would um, be a, the a little one, bit too long. <laughs> the one nerd snipe that is on my mind most right now is the Thermo one. The reason for that is the March bonus puzzle for my Patreon is related to that nerd snipe. And it is an example of the minimum known currently. What is the minimum known number of? Cut cell the right. minimum, the minimum known for thermo right now is twenty cells. You can do three thermos. We believe three thermos is probably the minimum, because to do two, you would have at most eighteen cells, and there are so <laughs> few seventeen cell uh, classic Sudokus. It seems very unlikely that something as restricted as two sets of the digits one to nine in connected groups is going to ever give a unique solution. I haven't ruled it out, but that seems um, quite unlikely. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. So yeah, we, I mean, three thermos, it's not that surprising that that exists because for three thermos, you can have 27 givens essentially. Um, originally I had found a 26, I think, and then I lowered it down to 23 after way too much effort, uh, using that circular pattern that I like, like in Tatooine Sunset. And then kind of out of nowhere, I got linked a puzzle by, uh, full deck and missing a few that they posted on LMD that they called absolute gas because it's a thermo that is a pretty simple solve pretty gas level maybe a little tougher um it only has 23 cells mm -hmm. with three thermos and that was the best i was aware of at the time and theirs was much more elegant um, <laughs> so i started messing with that pattern and got it down to 21 and then somebody on the forums got it down to 20. And I found a separate 20, which is the uh, March bonus puzzle. So yeah, sign up for my Patreon. You'll get content like that. <laughs> but I'm I'm close on 19, like frustratingly close. I have 19 down to three solutions. Interesting. And that's as close as I've been able to get it but I want to get it down to 19. And I don't think it would be very interesting if I did a live stream of me trying to get down to 19, because it's a very repetitive process. Um, I think I think Jovi mentioned this <laughs> in <Yeah. laughs> answering. Um, a lot of the nerd snipes, I, I spend a lot of time with Rank Solver on F puzzles, and I will try things i'll put the solution count on and look for weak candidates candidates that if i can force them somehow they're going to give a unique solution and i'll tinker with the shape of whatever constraint and see if i can reduce it and it's it's just an iterative process there's some it intuition involved if you do something for long enough 
and looking at the same patterns over and over again, you start to get an idea of what's going to work and what's not. But yeah, it's it's not very exciting, but that's not something I would rule out ever doing. And yeah, if it was if it was something that hadn't been explored very much, that would probably make more of an interesting stream, look real. Yeah, the <laughs> problem is finding something that fits that bill. Right, uh. right. <laughs> I, right. I feel like we've explored most of the very common constraints at this point. Yeah. So it'd have to be a new constraint. Yeah, if some new constraint comes up, that seems very interesting for that uh, sort of thing. Yep. Uh, why don't we take a look at the pictures that you've prepared for the white room? Uh, setting here so we'll just be able to do this right uh yeah let's try that see that okay there we go you can see that perfectly okay yeah so this is not white room Knowledge bomb. Um, this <laughs> when th when this was posed, um, Rank spent a little time on it. I believe with some sort of computer generation um, using his solver and got a thirty six cell. The best I was aware of at the time was a thirty four cell, and I call that a trivial thirty four cell. It's not. 34, it, it, it's not trivial in the sense that um, it's completely obvious to anybody, but it makes use of uh, just having repetitive rows just cycled. Mm -hmm. um, I posted a long thing in theory and programming about this related to a recent gas puzzle. Um, but basically, uh, you you put like a, a one in the top left and then a three, two cell, and then a six, three cell, and then a 10, and then a 15. And you just do the triangular numbers. And then right. you modify it to make the cages shorter. Like if you have a 15 and five, you can turn that into a 30 and four on the other side of the row. Right. So 45 minus 15. Obviously the one is cheating. So... If you don't want to cheat, um, you have to turn that into an eight cell 44. So that's why the count is so high. It has two eight cell cages. So I was aware of that one. Um, but basically you can do you can do a killer with 34 cells and only eight cages. You don't mm -hmm. need the nine cell 45. That's just a whole row. Right. Um, so I was aware of that. As far as I knew, um, that was the best that was known. It wasn't actually the best that was known. Sam was aware of a 31. But the the eight cages was the best that was known, as far as I know. I haven't I haven't seen anybody dispute that. So, so I just started messing with it. Um initially I did something with the fist file ring, just trying something out. So mm -hmm. that's why there are a lot of low cages around here in this. Um, but yeah, I just started adding cages. I added a bunch of low cages on the Fistimafel ring, added some high cages elsewhere, eventually got, I I think initially I found a 36 and then I lowered it to 32. So this is hmm. 32. This is the first one I posted in Ethereum programming. This was on, I believe, July 1st, 2021. And I spent basically the next day lowering it to 26. So this is the same 32, but I took out two of the cages. I took out the 11 right here, and I took out the 14 down here. And using Rank's uh, solution count, you can see if I had a six in that cell, that would give me a unique solution. And hey, there's a three right here. Three plus six is nine. Right. <laughs> so that's a that's a 30 set. Um 
so that's the sort of thing I'm doing. I just took the 32 cell, I removed two cages, I added one cage, you get 30 cells. Right. Now, as you get lower, it gets more complicated. So you have to move cages around. So mm. I got rid of those 12 and there's a 13 here. And I just kind of dance around. But you can see a lot of the cages stay in the same place. Um, and that's just me trying uh, removing cages. <laughs> it's really jumping around on my uh, phone. It's funny. Um, it's just removing cages and trying trying to remove the ones that leave the fewest solutions if you remove them. Right. Um, remove two of those and see if you can add one and make it unique, and you've lowered it. So this is the 28 cell. I got it down to 26, and this one looks quite a bit different from this, um, but it was the same process. It was removing cages, adding cages, until I found something that worked. And this so looks pretty happy quite with a this. bit more similar to White Room than the first. Yeah, it's getting there. Um, it'll it'll look even more similar in a minute. Um, this was the first one I posted to the archive. I called it Derek and the Dominoes because all <laughs> of the cages are two cells. Right. Um, and so that got me on a Clapton theme. So a lot of these puzzles have titles related to Eric Clapton songs or bands. Um, so yeah, so I took Derek and the Dominoes after a break. I, I believe I posted this on the second and then I came back to it on the sixth because I realized it actually wasn't that far off from 24. So I took it and I turned it on its side <laughs> <laughs> and then I started messing with it. So this is the 24. Um, actually, this is in the Derek and the Dominoes format. And that's the 23. I actually don't remember why I had the turn on the side one. Um, that's 22. That's 21. Okay, and 20 is a little bit different. So already lower than I thought it was going to be. Um, 20 with 10 dominoes just seemed absurd at the time. Um, but yeah, got down to 20. Didn't really see how to lower it any. So at this point, rather than focusing on lowering the cell count, I focused on lowering the cage count. And there, there are a lot of uh, puzzles that I didn't include in this, in this series. Um, but the initial... The initial seven cage that I found was actually like 26 cells. It blew up because I was combining cages together. And then like I, I might have combined the six and five into an 11 at some mm -hmm. point. And then having to add cells to get the solution count down. And yeah, lots of dead ends in this process. Um, I would try something and it might seem promising for a while and then didn't go anywhere. And so I'd backtrack and try something different. Um, so yeah, this is a 20 cell nine cage and it's just got a four cell cage instead of two of the twos. Um, obviously this wasn't just two, two cell cages combined because you can't split right. this. But, um, this is an eight cell or an eight cage. Uh, I call this one the yard birds. Uh, this is the seven cage 20 cell, which I called blindest faith because I had already used blind faith and then I did blinder faith and <laughs> just on a thing. Um, so yeah, this, this was not the first seven cage that I found, but it was a 20 cell seven cage. Um, and seven cage was the fewest at the time. Um, this was a, what is this? 19 cell. That's very close. Um, and yeah, it's just a modification of this without this cell right here. Right. And maybe one, one cage got tweaked somewhere. 
Uh, maybe not. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, this cage got tweaked. Yeah. This is a 7, and this, this obviously doesn't add to 11 anymore. No. <laughs> and then, eventually, I found a 19. Uh, this one's called Powerhouse. And I had already commented in theory and programming that when I got to 20, um, somebody was asking, so 19's next. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to script that. I'm going to use a computer for that because I didn't think it was possible uh, to find my hand. Then I found the 19, and then I realized how close this was to 18 already. Like, it was under a 1,000 solutions, I think, and I pretty much immediately got it down to, like, 81, which was a good number. And this was on the 6th or 7th. I spent the next two days, I probably spent a good 16 hours on this, trying to get it down to 18. <laughs> um, I got down to th two or three solutions the night before, and it was late, and I had to get up early. We were selling the old house. I was doing some landscaping there. Had to get up at like 6 o'clock to do that. <laughs> and I woke up at 4, maybe, just to mess with this and finally got it down to 18. But you can see how similar the cages are. So I yeah. still have this 23 cage here. The 16 changed to a 17. Uh, this was a 24, but now it's a 15. And just some rearrangement up here. Um, and it went back to eight cages, but you can actually turn this into a seven cage pretty easily um, by flipping these two rows and combining the five with the six into an 11. Still unique. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I got there. And it's just a lot of trial and error and um, trying things out. And eventually you get an intuition for how the cages need to look. Right. Like obviously a cage that is spanning three different boxes is going to be powerful. Um, the cages that are interacting directly, so the 17 is forcing this to be a 6, things like that. Right. But it turns out the reason it's unique, you need cages that can disambiguate the digits. So these three cages are enough to disambiguate 6, 7, 8, 9. And only just barely, because if this were 6, 9, you would just have six, eight, nine in these cells. Right. And wouldn't know anything about seven. But the geometry of the cages with the smaller cages, it turns out this can't be six, nine. Um, and then the smaller cages, there are more cells there. It's 11 small cell cages or small cage cells <laughs> yeah. uh, versus seven for the high digits. But yeah, um, it's all about geometry. And almost all of the uh, all of the minimal killer puzzles that I found have something like this, where the high digits are kind of going in one direction, and the low digits are kind of going in a different direction, and it kind of feels like set a little bit. Like if I took these two rows and I took these two columns and I eliminate these cells, there's probably a set argument there, right? right. Um. I don't know that I've ever actually looked at it like that. There, <laughs> there's another one that definitely has some X-Wing stuff going on. But yeah, uh, that was the process. And it it really wouldn't make good for a good live stream. <laughs> <laughs> it might make for a fun live stream in that I would have company, but right. um, yeah, it's a tedious process for a lot of these. So when you were going through this process, did you ever end up like solving the ones that were i mean obviously you published the, the ones you published you would solve but did you solve every single puzzle that you came across i didn't scratch? solve all of them um so the 26 i thought looked cool mm -hmm. and gave it a cool name and i did solve that one to make sure it had a fair solution path um, I probably wouldn't have published it if I didn't think the solution path was interesting. Um, I definitely solved the 20 cell. 
and the 19 cell and then the 18 cell and when i found the 18 cell honestly i wasn't even worried if it would solve or not i was so exhausted by doing it <laughs> um i just posted in theory and programming i was like i hope this has a good solution i'll look at it later and a few people solved it before i got back to it but yeah i i didn't solve all of them i did like i said there there's some intuition there with how the cages relate to each other right that i had to get um and that tells you something about how the solve path looks right but i hadn't really thought about it in detail it was just more okay I know I have to place the cages like this. I'm not entirely sure why yet, but I'm going to do that. So. Yeah, it's it's just crazy. It also has a really nice old path, which is <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. So while I'm sharing the screen, I'm going to yeah. go back to an earlier question real quick. Uh -huh. um, I think I'm going to have to change this. I don't know how to change it. Okay, I'm going to stop screen. Streaming for a second, and then I'm gonna share again. Uh, this. So, <laughs> this is on the subject of earliest puzzles. This is definitely not the earliest puzzle I made, and I didn't even make this by myself. <laughs> um, but this is from the MIT Mystery Hunt. Um, I participated remotely on a team called Codex. Um, that's not the full name of the team, but I can't say the full name of the team because it changes every year. They pick a different codex to name okay. themselves after. <laughs> um, but in 2011, we won the hunt. And originally, I was going to be more involved in making the hunt. I was actually um, an editor on the hunt. But because of stuff going on in my life, I ended up not being as involved as I wanted to be. So I had exactly one author credit. She searched my name on the MIT Mystery Hunt. This is the only thing that will come up. And this is the entire puzzle. It looks <laughs> like there should be something below it. But the entire puzzle is just the title. And my contribution to this was not coming up with the idea for the puzzle. My contribution was coming up with a phrase that worked. So, yeah, getting the word shags into the mis MIT mystery hunt, that, that was me. Your greatest <laughs> achievement. <laughs> My greatest achievement. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to think about that later, I'm not going to spoil the solution. But... Yeah, I, I couldn't spoil the solution even if I, I wanted to. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's a solution button at the top on the wrong window right here. Oh okay. if you just give up at some point. But yeah. Anyway. Just wanted to share that. I, I thought of that when I was thinking about the earliest puzzle question and forgot to share it at the time. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. <laughs> yeah. It it has to be in there too. It, it's a required word for the, for the puzzle. So I think uh, one question that uh, is on everyone's mind in regards to what your room is, did you ever get to 17 gauge cells and why, why or why not? No. So um, the first thing to know is if you had a 17 cell killer, you could just fill in the digits that are in that solution and you would have a 17-cell classic Sudoku. So that's the first thing to think about. Um, there are very few 17-cell classic Sudoku. 17 is the minimum. Um, at the time White Room was made, the number of known distinct 17-cell Sudoku puzzles was 49,158. Since then, it has been shown that that is the total. There are no more. Um, I was actually involved in the tail end of that search, um, but it used a lot of the same um, techniques as the proof that there is no 16. It was building off of that. Hmm. 
Um, so it has been shown that there are exactly 49,158 17 cell classics. So the question was, can we take one of those and turn it into a killer and have a unique solution? So I thought about this and I posted some thoughts in theory and programming. I was, I was convinced it wouldn't work, but, um, I figured we could, we could try and look at this with some programming. So there are a couple of criteria that you need. Um, one is you need to be able to rearrange the classic so that the di digits are next to each other. Right. And you need to do so in such a way that the digits that end up paired or as part of a triple. So I, I can rearrange my classic so that there's a nine and an eight next to each other. And I could make that a 17 gauge. Do I still have a unique solution? Well, that depends on whether I could have an eight and a nine. Right. Rather than a nine and an eight. So not only um, do you have to be able to rearrange it so that all the digits are connected and can be replaced by cages, you have to do it in such a way that you can't swap any of them and still have a unique solution. Um, so somebody actually beat me to scripting this, but I, I did code for it later to confirm the results. Um, it turned out that there were... I'm going to get the number wrong. It's something like 167 or 137 or 173. I don't know. There's seven in there, I think. <laughs> um, less than 200 grids that you can even rearrange to get digits next to each other like that. Without an isolated there digit. Is a... What? Without an isolated digit, basically. Right, without an isolated digit. Um, and without like... A one, two, one right here that has to be right, a three cell right. cage. Um, so the, somewhere in the hundreds of those. The second criteria, there is only one of those <laughs> that fulfills oh the second criteria. So we took that grid, that one unique grid, and I just put it in F puzzles and started messing with it. The closest you can get with it is like a thousand solutions. There's mm -hmm. no way to disambiguate some of the low digits and there's no way to disambiguate some of the high digits. Um, so yeah, that proves it's impossible. At the time it proved that if it were possible, there must be another 17 given classic that we haven't found yet. But now that we know that there's not, we know that there is no 17 cell killer. Um, now, if I had thought to do this in the first place, rather than doing all this stuff by hand and tweaking <laughs> cages and starting from 32 cells, I would have realized that you could take that 17 cell that has a low solution count and you can modify it just a little bit and make an 18 cell out of it. So I never would have found white room if I had done that in the first place. And I also would have found it probably faster. But sometimes it's good to mess with things by hand. You find interesting things. Honestly, the fact that no 17 cell filler uh, cage puzzle works is makes it that much more impressive that you found the 18, an 18 one by hand. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, pretty insane. Yeah. Now, since then, I found a number of other 18s. Um, I think I have eight now. Uh, most of them all dominoes. Uh, I found a whole series of them. It's like six different ones that have the same arrangement of cages, but different sums in them. Hmm. But yeah, White Room is easily the most interesting of them. Right. Uh, Joe Beal had asked, what is your second favorite solving technique? Because we all know Swordfish is your favorite. <laughs> I don't know that swordfish is my favorite solving technique. I think swordfish is probably my favorite thing to put in a puzzle. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I I don't know that I particularly like solving puzzles with swordfish um, more than anything else. 
Um, but yeah, if, if I interpret that as set as my favorite solving technique, um, probably my second favorite. I want to say like an XY ring might be my second favorite, but I could express that as set too, probably. Um, <laughs> So that would that would probably be my answer. An X Y ring. I think they're really pretty. Interesting. <clears throat> uh, we have a couple questions here that are similar in the vein of uh, this question by David. Are you amazed slash full of pride at how much your gas series has taken off? Yeah. Um, Clover and I were talking about this the other day. Um, neither of us expected it to last as long as it had, I don't think. Um, and when I got involved with it, I was definitely not known for making easy puzzles. Um, some would argue that I am still not known for making easy puzzles, even though I close <laughs> gas all the time. <laughs> um, sometimes my gas puzzles are a little harder than they should be. Um, but yeah, I, I got involved with gas primarily because I was one of the few people that was posting in Sudoku recommendations regularly at the time. And when, uh, when gas took off, it, it was kind of going to affect me a little bit in that we were saying, you know, there's, too much traffic in Sudoku recommendations. This isn't really what it's for. Well, probably me posting a bunch of fish puzzles and pie puzzles all the time <laughs> isn't really what it was for either. Um, but yeah, I, I got invited to do it. And originally we had even talked about like once a week, I would post a harder puzzle and we immediately abandoned the idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just, I started experimenting with making easier puzzles and got better at it um some of my some of my early ones are not that great honestly but you get more comfortable with it the more you do it david also asked thank you uh, clover that's very nice uh wait what is your favorite part about setting gas puzzles uh mm -hmm. my favorite part of setting gas puzzles is interacting with clover and bill because our our team chat is just a hoot um we're we're so silly all the time uh and i get to i get to solve clover and bill puzzles all the time as well which is great um yeah yeah interacting with them is a lot of fun we we plan silly things series of puzzles and gas who and <laughs> last year's april fools thing which was nuts and <laughs> yeah a lot of fun uh and i guess this question from someone in chat is also sort of related to uh to us because it's it's a why <laughs> uh I, i'm gonna try to pronounce his name ali sana asked how does it feel to be one of the most featured setters on ctc not only one of the most featured setters i'm currently the most yeah. featured setter in terms of puzzles um, but only because I cheat. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the reason I passed um, Sam and Clover initially is because I posted several gas days that were four puzzles that were the same pattern of givens, just with different constraints. Um, and yeah, so I cheated and got four puzzles for one day and jumped ahead a little bit. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm I'm sure Clover is going to overtake me soon enough. Um, he has. She's been featured by Simon more frequently um, in the past year and a half. I haven't had a Simon feature since White Room, I think. So yeah, Clover will overtake me eventually, unless I cheat some more, right? Which I might. Uh, but it's it's pretty cool. It was it was neat seeing my name climb up the list. Um, but. Yeah, since since I since I cheated to get on top, um, it's not the most impressive accomplishment ever. 
uh, Shy had asked, which of your which of your old tattooing puzzles is your favorite? Uh, Sunset is my def definitely my favorite. Um, it was it was computer generated in the sense that I was operating on a per uh, particular pattern and looking for interesting puzzles out of it. It wasn't completely randomly generated. Um, like a lot of the really hard puzzles are just starting from something and tweaking digits. Um, but I had a big spreadsheet of related puzzles um, that had a lot of swordfish. I was looking for how many swordfish they had, basically, and classifying them based on that. And then looking at the ones that had a lot and seeing how they solved after all the swordfish. and Tatooine Sunset, and there was one other one that was very closely related, um, were definitely the coolest, and that's why I picked it first to publish. So, um, I've had some, some I'm really happy with. Um, there is one, what did I call that? I think it's called A Great Disper Disturbance in the Force. Um, it's a tattooing puzzle, but some of them would end up with digits inside of one of the sun shapes. So I decided those weren't tattooing suns, those were dust stars. <laughs> and um, this particular one, the way you solve it, the first few givens that you get are down the diagonal. So it looks like the dust oh, star is mean. shooting <laughs> at Alderaan and right. blowing it up. Yeah. That, that is so I like cool. that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how often do you go looking for puzzles to solve, and where do you usually look? Uh, these days I don't look that often, just because I constantly have Clover and Build puzzles to test. Um, I will I will go a few days without testing anything, and then test like 10 Clover and Build puzzles in a row. And that's kind of all I need. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't solving a lot of Sudoku or pencil puzzles before I started setting, so um, I'm not I'm not really the type of person that I uh, like need my daily solve. But I have certainly had plenty of things to solve recently. Um, before that, uh, I'll look in the archive every now and then. I used to look in testing quite a bit and just see if there was anything that was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't spend a whole lot of time on Logic Masters Germany. Um, in fact, the only reason I'm on there is because I decided to post some of the nerd snipes. Um, but I have searched on there occasionally and just looked for like hard rated puzzles, like three, four, maybe five star puzzles that don't quite have enough solves because people like to get rated on there. Right. Um, and people will send me stuff sometimes. So that's nice. I appreciate when people think of me to send their puzzles to. Don't say that. You're going to get a bunch of <laughs> requests. <laughs> oh, oops. I didn't see this. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I really don't mind. I, I was mentioning yesterday, wasn't it? Um, Glipperall was apologizing to Jovi about pinging or making sure it was okay to ping. It's like nobody asks anymore if it's okay to ping me because they know that that's just food for the Newman neural network. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like getting pinged and I like interesting questions. So, what do you think about the uh, the Newman neural network jokes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty good. I named one of my puzzles NNN. <laughs> uh, so, obviously, I'm on board with the idea. Uh, uh, Jovi just pinged me more food. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. Have you done any collaborative setting? Uh, not a lot. Um, a little bit though. Uh, one of the one of the puzzles in the. Second Cracking the Cryptic book is a collab with Ryokusha. Um, 
he kind of came up with the friendly cell constraint. I think mm-hmm. I think he in- he came up with it, but he had he had been exploring the constraint a lot and what you could do with it, and we ended up posting about it in theory and programming, and then he sent me some ideas for some cool techniques that could be um, could be found using friendly cells, and I kind of took that and ran with it and made a puzzle out of it, and yeah. Uh, so we do some things like that. Um, I've had a few puzzles, like the the minimal arrow puzzle. Um, I definitely felt like I needed to give author credit to Blue Jay for that, because I had just started from Blue Jay's six arrow puzzle and slightly modified it. So it was like. Right. Blue Jay did ninety five percent of the work. I did <laughs> I did a little bit at the end. Obviously, I'm going to credit them. Um, I like collaborating on things. I I kind of miss when we did the voice chat collabs. Um, I don't guess we've done one of those in a while, or I've missed them. Um, but I don't do a whole lot of. I'm specifically looking to collaborate with this person, and we're going to start from scratch and bounce ideas back and forth about something. I've never really done that. I would like to at some point. Um, It just hasn't happened. So Mm. I was actually talking a few months ago about doing something very similar to what Grockles did with the Gus puzzle series, which is collaborating on puzzles with a bunch of different people and making a pack out of it. So maybe someday. Uh, well, we should do the rapid fire questions because we're running out of time. Uh, so one answer or the other, uh, as quick as you can, or take your time if you want to, um, <laughs> apparently, uh, local or global deductions. Global. Coloring or good lifting. Coloring. Uh, simple or complex. complex that I can explain in a simple way. <laughs> okay. Uh, geometry or arithmetic? Ooh, it's tough. For Sudoku, geometry. Okay. In general, arithmetic. Interesting. Uh, Penpa or F-puzzles? F-puzzles. But only uh, because of ranks solver. Right. <laughs> Sudoku or pencil puzzles? Sudoku. I like solving pencil puzzles. I just don't do as much of it. Chaos or order? That's tough. Um, Because obviously I like patterns, but my setting process is more chaotic, I think. I'll go chaos. Not chaos constructions, though. (laughs) I've never tried (laughs) one of those. (laughs) Uh, calculator or abacus? <laughs> um, neither. I would probably just do it in my head. <laughs> okay. Interesting answer. Uh, cages or lines? Cages. Arrows or dots? Oh. I'll go with dots. I really like arrows, though. Uh, to disambiguate at the end of a puzzle, a given or a clue? Uh, given if I have to, but probably I would just redo the puzzle until I got rid of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, outside or inside clues? Inside. Are you good or evil? <laughs> um, I'm good. Um, the impression of me might not be, but my reputation might not be. <laughs> Are you uh, lawful or chaotic? Oh, definitely chaotic. That's that's all of them. All right. Did I pass? Uh, I don't are know. You gonna, so are you going to tell me what? <laughs> are you going to tell me what animal I am? <laughs> or what? Um, what? Pokemon character I am or something. 
Yeah. Um, your your Pikachu. Yeah. That's that's a good idea for a gas intro. I'm gonna remember that. <laughs> um, what do you what do you think about the perception, especially from Mark, that you're the hardest gas setter? <laughs> I'm the easiest gas setter and everybody knows it. I don't know <laughs> what he's talking about. No, I I think it's fair. It's it's a lot to do with how I set puzzles. Even even with the gas, I don't always start with um these are the easy deductions that I want. Uh I'm going to start with those and then put in more clues to follow along with that. Sometimes I will literally just start making something pretty not necessarily even going for a gas puzzle. And I did one of these recently, it was an arrow puzzle. I put in arrows just around the outside of the grid and around the ring inside of that. And then I added one more arrow and it was unique. <laughs> and that that's cool and um, probably impossible to solve. But a lot of times in gas, when we do arrow puzzles, we'll just give the circle um and make it less about figuring out what the sum is and more about figuring out what needs to go on the arrow. So I just gave all the circles except for that last one hmm. and made it a gas puzzle. Uh so I'll do that sometimes. Sometimes that works to make it very easy and logical. Um in this case, yeah, I I agree Clover in this case that it was good. Sometimes I'll I'll come up with something that's just way too hard and even trying to nerf it and make it gas, it doesn't quite work, but maybe sometimes it'll get posted anyway because Clover and Bill are too good at solving and yeah, um, sometimes things slip through that trip people up. And also sometimes I just post something even though I know it's too hard. Interesting. That's mean like that. <laughs> Is there something that you see other setters do that annoys you? Do you have a puzzling pet peeve? Puzzling pet peeve. Um, I get annoyed when somebody does something too clever that I wish I had done. Right. So, is that a pet peeve? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, the honestly, the the um. Disambiguing clue at the end used to bother me a lot. Mm -hmm. I get why people do it, um, and I'm I've done it at some point. There's some constraints that you just have to, but that annoyed me for a while. It doesn't really bother me anymore. Interesting. Uh, do you have any advice for setting puzzles? Like, what, what's your best piece of advice for setting puzzles? My best piece of advice is just try stuff. Just put stuff in a grid, use F puzzles, use rank solver, so you can get an idea of what's going on. Um, I would say don't rely on it totally to tell you that it's solvable. Make sure you can solve it. But yeah, just try stuff out. And sometimes something emerges from seemingly random patterns. Um, that's worth pursuing. Hmm. Um, and I have to do this question because, uh, yeah, it's just it's just a question I have to do. Uh, what's a question you want to be asked, and what's your answer to it? What's a question I want to be asked? Well, yeah. a, a couple of weeks ago, I just got pinged again, didn't I? Um, a <laughs> couple of weeks ago, uh. It was Clem Hippo, right? Was asked about a talent. Yeah. Am I remembering that right? And I said I was hoping that I would get asked that because I have a dumb answer for it. Okay. <laughs> um, so my dumb answer. Um, a friend of mine one time asked. Um, uh, it's a classic. Um, supposed to be unsolvable sort of question, like deep philosophical thing what is the sound of one hand clapping and i just immediately went like this and started clapping with one hand um and yeah. anybody can do that and some people can do that better than i can do it 
but yeah, that's my talent. <laughs> oh, let's all give you a round of applause. <laughs> a one-handed round of applause. Please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. I forgot about that. I should have should have written that down when you said that. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I have I have a memory like uh, something with a good memory, and yeah, <laughs> I remember stupid stuff like that. Except I can't remember what animals have good memories. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That was the joke. Right. I made a joke. It's not because I forgot. I promise. <laughs> All right. Well, that that brings us to the two hour mark. Um, good ending. <laughs> <laughs> good ending. Uh, terrible joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone, for sticking around and watching. And thank you so much, Philip, for uh, coming on and talking about everything. I really enjoyed it. I hope Thank you, guys you for having too. me. And uh, do you remember uh, the person who will be on next? I do. I'm, af I'm afraid of butchering the pronunciation because I, I never know how to pronounce anything until I hear somebody else pronounce it. Um, but the next setter is Fluda. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, so next week we'll have Filuta. Uh, I think I want to say exactly one week from now, uh, but I could be wrong. <laughs> but yeah, just wait to see the schedule on YouTube, and we should have some good fun. And this was good fun. Thank you again, Philip, and thank you to Chad for sticking thank around. You. Yeah. Like, comment, subscribe, I think I'm supposed to say. Legally yeah. required. I'm supposed to say that, but I always forget and okay. don't really care anyway. So, <laughs> thanks everybody for coming. Yeah, it's a lot uh, of fun. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Good rest of your weekend. Bye. <laughs>